God's Word together. Uh, this morning we're going to be looking at uh, the book of 2 Corinthians, uh, chapter 1. And so if you would like to turn in your Bibles or however you uh, want to do that, uh, 2 Corinthians, uh, chapter 1. Pastor Tim is, is uh, over in teaching in Paulus today. So here I am. Great. I'm just going to go ahead and pray again before we, we get into God's Word. Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you that we're able to gather together this morning. We thank you for your Word, that it is truth. And Father, we ask that you would bless your Word as we consider it this morning. That you would... Lord, open each heart to receive what you have for them this morning, and just help me to communicate your word faithfully. For your glory we ask, in Jesus' name, amen. So, Alex, uh, which mic should we go with? Or We're good? Okay, this one's tired. Okay, um, you know, there, there are... Um, there are there are seasons in our our Christian walk in which we could describe as uh, times of trial, testing, uh, dark times, times when we are longing for comfort, for encouragement, for uh, deliverance. And this morning we're going to consider the words of of someone who was well acquainted with trials and difficulty. Uh, as we look at this letter to the Corinthians, written by the Apostle Paul. So, this letter begins, uh, I'm reading from the ESV, it's up here for you as well. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God that is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in the whole of Achaia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Paul knew that he had been commissioned by God to spread the good news, to be an apostle of the good news, a messenger of the truth that salvation lies in the person of Jesus Christ. And as we, we read his letters, I'm just going to pause. So... What should we do? Should we get rid of this one, or should we do this one? One book, and everyone's too far away, so that it's going to be easier to read. Okay, because I just don't want to torture people with these after this okay. time. Sorry, everybody. Back on? Okay. So, um, no, it's not. Uh, by the time Paul wrote this, this epistle, uh, he was very well acquainted with uh, suffering. Um, but the su despite the hardships that he had encountered, uh, by the grace of God, he was willing to continue on, to keep moving forward, to pay the price of suffering, to still share the gospel, the good news. And he knew that he wasn't the only one that was experiencing suffering, hardship, that those in Corinth that he was writing to, that they also were experiencing suffering. So in this greeting, the first thing that Paul does is, as he's inspired by the Holy Spirit to pen these words, is to point them to God's character. Where he says here, he says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. The word blessed means praiseworthy, that God is praiseworthy, to be praised. Yeah? And he goes on to say that, that he is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, speaking of the, the, the union that they have within the Trinity, but then also that he is the Father of mercies, 
the father of compassion, of sympathy. And this word, it speaks of a desire to bring relief to the one who is suffering. Compassion, which takes action. And so God the Father is described for us here as being the father of mercies. That he is the origin or the source of mercy. Yeah. If God had not revealed mercy to us, then we wouldn't have never known what mercy was. Because it originates from him. That he is the source of any true mercy that we have received in this life. Whether it comes directly from him, or he has orchestrated it to come to us in some other way. Yeah? So think about that for a moment. That any true mercy that you have received up to this point and will throughout your life, that the origin of that mercy, the source of that mercy, is your Heavenly Father. Your Father that cares about you beyond measure. So think about any moment where you have received mercy in your life, no matter how it's come to you, God orchestrated that to make it to you in whatever form that it came. So any mercy that we receive in this life, we can give thanks and praise back to God because it originated with him. Daniel prayed, he said, to the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness. In that prayer, Daniel's prayer, he's conveying the fact that mercy is a possession. It belongs to the Lord. It is part of his character, but also his possession that he can met out as well. Micah, he writes, who is a God like you? pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. So mercy is God's possession, his attribute, which he delights in being able to bestow upon his creation. So mercy is his possession that you and I have been so freely made recipients of through his son Jesus. Recipients of his mercy. And we can say with David as David penned in Psalm 86.5, for you Lord are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. So we can praise God for his abundant mercy that we have been made recipients of, even though we're so undeserving, if we're honest with ourselves, we realize we are undeserving of God's mercy. Now Paul, he also couples God's possession of mercy with comfort. That he indeed, that he is the God of all comfort. Not some comfort, or a little bit of comfort, but all comfort. Some of you know my, my daughters, uh, my daughter Ashley, uh, when she was very little, she liked to make up words. And um, one of the words that she, she made up for something that was very small was she would say, it's a tiny tip. Yeah, it's just a tiny tip of something. So we, we, you know, we, we began to speak her language, a tiny tip. Well, God's, uh, you know, his mercy is not a tiny tip. Yeah. His comfort is not a tiny, tiny tip. He is the, the God of, of all comfort. Yeah. And so, like him being the source of mercy, he's also the source of any true comfort that we have received, no matter the avenue that it has come to us. Whenever we receive any true comfort, we can thank our gracious God, because that comfort has originated in his heart for us. And the word comfort here, it's, it's more than just a little bit of sympathy or you know, a little pat on the back or a little word of encouragement. Uh, the Greek word that's used here, it means to, to call, be called along someone's side to strengthen, to help. And so it's speaking of a personal, 
supernatural comfort that God gives towards us reaching us in some capacity, whether he's using another person or just him directly bestowing his comfort upon us. And if we think about that, that should strike awe in us, really, that the infinite, holy, almighty God, that he desires to comfort us by coming to our side, ministering to us, reviving us, and strengthening us to be able to face the pressures and trials of life. The God who spoke everything into existence has always existed, always will exist. The Holy One desires to do that for you and for me. The word that's used here uh, for comfort, it has the same uh, root word that Jesus used to describe the Holy Spirit when he was describing the Holy Spirit to his disciples in John chapter 14, where he called the Holy Spirit the Comforter. And so, we bring those two together, yeah? the Holy Spirit, who is the comforter, his present ministry is to meet us, to come alongside us in our darkest times, our darkest hours, to come alongside you and comfort you and strengthen you supernaturally, beyond what any human comfort could. And thinking about that, that the Spirit, the third person of the triune God is there for you and for me to minister to us every day. He desires to. He's not a force. He's not a power or a feeling. He's God. Holy God. Divine, all-powerful. And his concern is for you and for me, and he desires to comfort us supernaturally. You know, Jesus promised the disciples that, that they would not be left as orphans, but that the Holy Spirit would come to dwell in them forever. And we too, in Christ, we have the same promise, that we have been made recipients of the Holy Spirit, the comfort. And so when trials come, maybe you're in them right now, I don't know, we need to know that we're, we're not alone. And then we turn to the one who knows us better than we know ourselves and knows how to minister to us in ways that no one else knows, to turn to him in our darkest hour. That he who possesses all mercy, all comfort, it's all at his disposal that we would turn to him and ask him to pour out his mercy upon us, to comfort us with his supernatural comfort, to allow the Holy Spirit to come and to minister to us. Paul writes, who comforts us in all our affliction. That word affliction, it means trouble, distress, opposition, tribulation. It's from the same word that was used for when the grapes were put in a wine press and they were crushed to make wine. It's a tough experience for the grapes, right? <laughs> and sometimes we feel like we're the grapes. That we're going through a wine press experience. He uses another word uh, in verses 6 and 7 uh, that is translated as suffering, which it means misfortune. It's a general term, but, but it means anything that causes Pain in, 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 or distress, grief, whether mind or, or body. So afflictions, suffering. God desires to comfort us in all of them. And we should take note that, that Paul, as he's writing here, he writes as, as, as if affliction and suffering is to be an expected part of the Christian life. That's because they are. If we read our New Testament, you know, we realize that and just living life, right? To the first century believer, it was that was a reality. They knew that suffering came with following Jesus. But many ask, and it's a valid question, why do we 
suffer? Why would God allow such things to happen, especially to his children? And those are hard questions to answer. Some suffering comes merely because we live in a fallen, sinful world. Other suffering comes because we make bad decisions and we sin. Mm -hmm. We may also suffer for our faith. There's a variety of reasons why suffering may come our way. And I believe it's, it's, it's hard for us, even though we were given great insight within the scriptures about why we may suffer, that we're, we're probably not going to completely understand until we're on the other side. And then we'll have clarity when we pass on to the world. But one thing is certain, one thing is certain, that we can know that the God who loves us more than we can fathom, that if he has allowed suffering and affliction to come our way, he's allowed it for a purpose, for our eternal good. To produce lasting spiritual fruit. He doesn't let us suffer purposely, without purpose. But he who is the, the God of all comfort and the Father of mercies and is infinitely wise, he has a plan and a purpose in the pain. Now, as I've studied the, the portion that we're going to look at here, I, I I've seen five fruits of, of, of why God might allow suffering to come our way. And as I do this, it's going to be a bit methodical. I'm going through the scriptures. Uh, it might seem a little clinical. Um, I don't want to excuse your pain in any way. I realize that pain is not fun. <laughs> suffering is not enjoyable. And so I'm not downplaying that in any way, shape, or form. But hopefully, as we look at these verses, that we'll have hope that suffering can produce good. There's purpose in the pain. He writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us, in all of our affliction. One of the reasons Paul was able to write to the Corinthians with such a confidence that God is indeed the Father of mercies and God of all comfort is because he had already personally received God's mercy and comfort in the midst of trials and difficulties. Paul wasn't just writing good theology. He was writing from practical, personal experience. I'm just going to remind you of some of the things that Paul experienced. Later in this letter, he writes, Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. For a night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people. Danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brethren, a lot of danger if you have noticed, <laughs> in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from the other things, there's the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all of the churches. Paul knew about suffering. He knew about trials. He knew about affliction. But he had also experienced God's mercy and his comfort in those afflictions firsthand. And so one fruit that God can produce through suffering for us is practical experience of knowing who God is. That he is indeed the father of mercies and God of all comfort. We can know his attributes of mercy and comfort to be absolutely true 
because we have experienced them ourselves. Oftentimes when we are faced with suffering or trials, the Lord is providing a little window of opportunity for us to get a deeper understanding of who he truly is. Revealing to us more about his character, showing us a bit more of his glory. You may recall in John's Gospel, when Jesus received the message that his friend whom he loved, Lazarus, was ill. And Jesus did not heal Lazarus from afar, nor did he go to Lazarus to heal him. What did he do? He waited. And then he got there. Lazarus had already died. He had already been placed in the tomb. And his sisters, Martha and Mary, were questioning Jesus. You know, basically, if you would have been here, things would have been different. And Jesus said this to Martha. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Shortly thereafter, Jesus would call the dead Lazarus out of the tomb. Lazarus came forth, and Lazarus came forth. And so Mary, Martha, Lazarus, and many others, they experienced practically that Jesus is indeed the resurrection and the life. They saw it firsthand. They saw a dead man walking out of a tomb. But in the process, they had to go through pain. Lazarus had to go through the pain of whatever he suffered from that brought him to death. Mary and Martha had to go through the pain of watching their brother die and burying him. But there was purpose in the pain. God was revealing more of himself. More of himself to them. You know, in the Old Testament, Job is known as a book of suffering, right? Well, Job was a real guy who really lived. And we're said that he was, he was a good man. He was a righteous man. And God allowed him to suffer greatly at the hands of our adversary. Now, Job knew God before the suffering. But at the very end of the suffering, this is what Job says. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Job had seen God more clearly in his suffering. He knew God in greater depths than he did before when he was living in prosperity and ease. Now I've experienced many physical ailments in my missionary experience. In some of my most intimate times with God have been when I have been in the greatest physical pain. And I would not now trade that because God met me in those times. It was worth the pain to have him comfort me in that way. He is good. And he can bring good out of the pain. And so God may allow suffering to produce the fruit of knowing him more intimately more personally. Let's read on. Verse 4. Who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, 
For we know that as you share in our sufferings, you also will share in our comfort. The second reason that God may allow suffering to come our way, and you know, they, they can be multiple reasons tied together, but is to produce the fruit of comforting others with God's comfort. God may allow afflictions to come our way, and he meets us and he comforts us in those afflictions, and then later when someone else is going through suffering, we can relate to them in their suffering, and we can be used as vessels to extend his comfort to them. I mean, just, uh, was it last night? Well, on Friday night at, at YFC, we were talking about various things with, with the, the youth. And, you know, James brought up how, you know, he experienced his dad dying. But how God had met him and his mother in that. And James was able to use that experience to minister to the youth of the goodness of God. Even though it wasn't a, a fun experience losing his dad. See, God desires to use us for his glory, to effectively minister to others. And if we have been through afflictions and known God's comfort, his strengthening firsthand, it's in a sense much easier for us to minister to those who are currently in the midst of trial doesn't necessarily have to be the exact same trial or affliction. What matters is, is that we have been in great need and God has met us in that time. And we can assure them, God has met me. God can meet you. He can do the same. He's carried me through. He's comforted me. He's strengthened me and given me supernatural peace and the ability to keep pressing forward. And he can do the same. For you, because he is still the father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He can do that. You know, as we as we seek to minister to those who are who are currently hurting, we can point them to the God of all comfort. Because he has met our needs, he can meet theirs. Since we've already been through times of affliction in trial and experience God's comfort and strengthening, we can be used as vessels to extend that same comfort to others. Vessels that he can use. You know, trials, trials are a bit like that plow that makes those furrows in the field so that, you know, the water can flow a bit more easily down those rows. See, trials, they have, in a sense, the ability to uh, painfully dig a channel through us so that we can be used as vessels for God's comfort to flow through us to others. My wife and I, we, we lost our, our first child miscarriage, a painful experience for both of us, and in that, we received, that was many years ago, by the way, um, <laughs> we experienced God's comfort through many other people who had experienced the same thing, who came around us and were used as vessels to minister to us God's comfort that we needed in that time. And years later, I recall a woman who had experienced the same thing, and how Gina and I were able to come alongside her and her husband and minister to them with the same comfort that we had received. So our suffering can work for good in a variety of ways. But as he, he writes there in verse 4, he uses the word may. That's a conditional word. It, it may. It, it, it might. It could. It may. You 
see, we have to allow the Lord to comfort us when we are in need. I mean, sometimes, yeah, he just comes and supernaturally just pours out his comfort and his mercy upon us. But at other times, we have to receive it. You know, he's used another brother or sister to share with us comforting words, and yet we, uh, we reject them. Or they want to pray for us, and we're like, uh, I don't want that. But it's God who's orchestrated that. He wants to comfort us. So we have to be in a spot where we're receiving his comfort, and then also, in order to minister to others, we have to be open to be used to comfort others. You know, maybe we've experienced pain and we've experienced God's comfort, but if we keep it to ourselves and we don't seize the opportunity to minister to others, mm -hmm. then we block the flow in a sense. So it's conditional. But knowing God's comfort, knowing his comfort, receiving it in the midst of our suffering, we can be used to minister to others in their time of need. And you know, as we respond to suffering, allowing God to comfort us, it can also be a powerful witness to those who do not know Jesus. When we're going through afflictions and trials, and those who are around us who do not know Jesus, look at the way that we respond. And they ask questions, probably in their head, how is a Christian going to deal with this problem? The way in which we respond and allow God to comfort us and to strengthen us, to give us his peace, can impact those around us who do not know Jesus. Because as they're looking at your life, and they can ask other questions like, how can they remain so calm in the midst of this trial? How can they smile and joke about the fact that they're in affliction? Why aren't they falling apart like I would fall apart? And hopefully they see that the answer is Jesus. When those outside see a believer who's in pain, in difficulty, but they also see the peace and they see the strength that's supernaturally given by God, they can look at that and realize, I don't have that. I don't know who they know. And throughout history, the church has been used in the midst of its suffering to be a witness to the world, and people in the world have looked and seen Christian suffering and thought, they have something I don't. And that's something. And so God can use our suffering to draw others to himself as we allow God to be that comfort, be that strength for us. Verse 5. It says, For we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. Jesus said to his disciples, he said, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. He also said, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. There are times where we may experience suffering because God is desiring to produce the fruit of being identified with Jesus. And in the process, being conformed to his image. Being made like Jesus. You may recall the disciples, early in their ministry, they were called before the Sanhedrin, the very same people that condemned Jesus to death. And they were yelled at, they were beaten, and they were told not to say the name of Jesus anymore. And they left after being beaten and threatened by the very same people who had killed Jesus. And it says, Luke records, so they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus at the time. They didn't listen. 
but they also were rejoicing that they had been identified with Jesus, found worthy to be identified with Jesus. The disciples rejoiced because they understood that they were being persecuted because Jesus was working in and through them. That they were chosen vessels for the Master's glory. You know, when we suffer or are afflicted, persecuted, because we're Christians, we should know that it's not so much we who are being persecuted, but it's Jesus in us. You may recall when, when the glorified Jesus appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus. He says to Saul, 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 why are you persecuting me? He didn't say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting the church? Because that's what he was doing. He was having Christians thrown in prison, possibly put to death. But Jesus says, persecuting me. Because ultimately, Saul was persecuting Jesus within the church. Who is Jesus, who is the head of the church. You know, you and I, we are just God's vessels, which may be despised because God is using us for his glory. And so suffering is part of being identified with Jesus. Jesus suffered at the hands of an evil world when he walked upon it in his incarnation. And he continues to suffer as he seeks to live his life through our lives by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He's still persecuted in the body of his church. You know, Paul would write, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And it's the same for every believer. That suffering, it's on Jesus' account when we're persecuted for being a believer. You know, suffering is, is part of living in a, in a fallen world, but also a fallen world with many adversaries opposed to Jesus. But suffering is on the road to glory. On the road to glory. I'm going to read some scriptures to you here. Philippians 1.29 For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. Romans chapter 8, verse 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. We love that part. If indeed we suffer with him. I don't really like that part that we may be glorified together. Suffering is on the road to glory. And then he writes, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us, that they're minute in comparison to the glory to come. See, suffering is a tool which God can use to produce the fruit of making us more like Jesus. James writes, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Romans chapter 5. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. God can use the suffering to make us more like Jesus, to give us his character and not our own. C.H. Spurgeon, who was in the Victorian era, called the Prince of Preachers in England, he wrote this, I am afraid that all the grace I have got out of my comfortable and easy times and happy hours might almost lie on a penny. 
But the good that I have received from my sorrows and pains and griefs is altogether incalculable. What do I not owe to the hammer and the anvil, the fire and the file? Affliction is the best bit of furniture in my house. It has been well said that, that those whom God desires to use greatly, he must first wound deeply. Because he's able to take that pain and make the person to be more like Jesus. And a vessel that can be more effectively used to minister to others. Paul wrote that while the afflictions were abounding in him and his co-laborers as they were sharing the gospel, that at the same time they received abounding comfort through God. That all the comfort was able to swallow up all the trouble that they were experiencing. You see, God's comfort and strength has the ability to overcome and transcend all the afflictions that come our way. He continues on. We're getting close to the end. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we have received the sentence of death. But that was to make us not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. Paul says, I, you know, I just want to let you know, we went through a little bit of a rough time. So much so that we had a death sentence on us. We thought we were going to die. We really did. We thought it was over. It was intense. Well, scholars have you know, argued about, what is he referring to? And just the short answer is, no one knows, okay? No one knows. A lot of people think it was Acts 19, where uh, Demetrius, the silversmith, uh, you know, basically uh, got the whole city in an uproar and caused a riot where they were seeking to uh, find Paul and to kill him. I mean, it's not every day that you have a whole city wanting to kill you. I mean, I don't know. I don't experience that. Maybe you do, but that must have been stressful. But he says, in, in, you know, in his time of deep despair and persecution, that God was still the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. And that the author of comfort, God himself, delivered them from that situation comfort them in the midst of it. And he says there, <clears throat> you're blanking out, sorry. Um, I will find it. There, verse 9. Indeed we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Afflictions and suffering, they can serve as an opportunity to produce the fruit of us remembering that the source of our life and our strength really comes from God. To remind us not to trust in ourselves but in God who raises the dead. Hardships serve as, as, as a reminder to us that our dependence should not be on ourselves. Even when things are fine and dandy, that we should still be relying upon God. And especially in the midst of trial, that we should be reliant upon Him. That He would be our strength. That He would be our empowering. Paul viewed afflictions as an opportunity to flee self-reliance. He writes later in the same letter, Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure, not the weird way, in infirmities and reproaches and needs and persecutions 
in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Because I'm reminded to rely upon God. That I am just a weak little being on a dirt clod flying through space. But I can rely upon the infinite, almighty God who raises the dead to give me life and strength. We can trust him, the one who loves us beyond measure. When the hardship comes, that we would turn to the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, to pour out his mercy, his comfort upon us. And even in the good times, the easy times, that we would seek to rely upon his spirit that he has given to dwell within us. Okay, our last verse in the passage we're going to look at, verse 11. It says, you also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on your, our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. Paul understood the power of prayer and called upon the Corinthians to engage in praying on his behalf. Linking this to this whole topic of suffering, suffering provides opportunity for the fruit of ministering to others in intercessory prayer. This is tied together with the, you know, dependence upon God. When someone is ill or in affliction in some way, in some trouble, it provides opportunity for us to rally around them in prayer consolation. We're giving the opportunity to minister. And they can be blessed by being prayed for, and we are blessed by being able to pray for them. Being part of the solution. Suffering should cause us to be more closely knit and joined together in the body of Christ as we seek to comfort one another and pray for one another through all the trials and tribulations that we face. So, suffering, afflictions, they're painful in the present, but there's purpose in the pain. God can produce fruit through the pain. There's the five. The fruit of knowing God and his character more intimately and personally. The fruit of comforting others with God's very comfort. The fruit of being identified with Christ and conformed to his image. The fruit of remembering our source and strength of life is God, not ourselves. It's he who raises the dead. And the fruit of ministering to others in intercessory prayer. And may we not forget the very beginning part of our study. That God is the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort. He has an infinite supply of mercy and comfort to give us in our time of need. And we're also given a promise. A promise that all these things that we experience that are painful, that they are temporary. Praise God for that. Paul writes, chapter 4, For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory, beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, they're passing, but the things that are unseen. Think about that list of suffering that Paul's already experienced. Beaten, stoned, shipwrecked, and he says, this light, momentary affliction, it cannot compare to the eternal weight of glory to come. Amen?
Father, we thank you that you are indeed the Father of mercies and the God of all. The church.